Well, hello everyone. This is Al Fadi. Thank you for joining us again in another uh, fabulous, uh, you know, live stream with our dear brother Sam. I am also known as Sham Shimon. We are going to be refuting or continue to refute uh, Shabir Ali, and uh, he, uh, if you recall, guys, this is episode three. About a month ago, I uh, took one of my actually series, video series on original sin, and just butchered a lot of references in the Bible, especially about what happened at the fall in Genesis 3. And Sam uh, graciously uh, made time for us to address this, uh, as we should, of course. We do not want to leave these kind of uh, false claims and uh, fake interpretations out there because people need to be equipped to respond appropriately. And some have done an amazing job by the grace of God to show how um, deeply in a, in equipped, I should say, and in prepared, uh, unprepared, I should say, Shabir Ali. So with that in mind, I want to welcome everybody who's been here and welcome everyone who's going to be joining us. And I want to welcome also our uh, uh, moderators. Uh, thank you so much for making time for us. Brother, uh, yes, brother. you're showing off your uh, Bruce Lee. No, that's you right. Go. I just want people to know before, here, I pray, before I pray, I want you to know. I'm ready to do battle and take out the spiritual foes with spiritual Jeet Kune Do. So I got my Bruce Lee t-shirt. It's white. I make white look good. You know how they say white makes you look bigger? I actually make white look good. So stop hating. Someone like my Batman shirt. But it's time to get Bruce Lee. What the? As we right. Right anyway, okay, that's... folks, you see what I go through. All right. I'll turn it over to you, bro. All right. Well, first of all, as is our habit, because you and I and everyone knows we are desperately in need of the Holy Spirit and his grace to sanctify us and perfect us and enable us to address these topics with integrity and honesty without error. So, Father, we love you and we need you and we depend on you, not just to teach, but to live for you and to love you. Empower us to know you and to obey you and to love you, to be in love with your son, to adore your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, your heart become flesh. <clears throat> cover us by the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, even our loved ones. In my case, my daughters and their mother. And Father, for the glory of your Son, Jesus, bless Al and I. Bless our union in <clears throat> the power and bond of the Holy Spirit. And guide us by your Spirit. Anoint us by your Spirit. Replenish <clears throat> us. Refresh us by your Spirit. And give us the health we need, especially to our throats, by your Spirit, to do justice to this topic. And save us from error and stammering. And enable us to recall the facts and interpret them correctly by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus. And Father, bless your children, the household of the living God, the church of Jesus Christ. Illuminate them to understand the depth of scripture, to see how easy it is to refute Islam and its lies and the false prophet Muhammad and convict Muslims of their error. And silence these enemies of the gospel like Shabir to blaspheme no more. And we ask this in Jesus' name because we love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Take over in Jesus' name. Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. All right? Amen. Hey, yeah. I've left some notes because I had to take notes. And I haven't finished watching his presentation. Some were wondering where you can find the presentation. It's not on his YouTube channel. <clears throat> it's on his Facebook page. If you go to Shibrali on his Facebook, he does live, live streams on his Facebook page. And if you go back to the archives, you'll see one in which he mentions Al-Fadi by name and original sin. So I think it's over an hour, maybe within an hour. I listened to half of it, and God willing, I'm going to listen to the rest of it to take copious notes, to accurately represent him to the best of my ability and refute him because it's full of lies and misinformation. Speaking of which, look who showed up, man, who just gave you a super chat, $100. Hater Wood, baby. You see that? You know, David, thanks, buddy. Everybody is, uh, is panicking. They say that you, they haven't seen you in a couple of days. So I'm glad you showed up uh, with the, your checkbook, at least. So that's great. Yeah, yeah so thank you, brother. And thank again, you, brother. the Lord Jesus to take over and save us from error. So <clears throat> one of the things he said, <clears throat> this is some of the points he made. So let's address this. Uh, Shabir in his presentation. So I took, I made a summary of his points. I didn't write out all his words word for word. That would take too long. One of the claims he made was, basically, if you go back to the story of Genesis, when the serpent told Eve <clears throat> that neither her nor Adam would die in the day that they eat of, <clears throat> of from the tree, thereby contradicting what God said in Genesis 2, verses 15 to 17, and yet the serpent turned out to be right. So I remember 
I wrote this down, claims that the serpent was right since Adam didn't die. States that the argument that a day with the Lord is a thousand years shows Adam did die that day since he was 930 years old when he died is a stretch. Now, let me explain what he means. And we're going to go to the passages. And my brother, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> he'll be reading the passages for us. You can read whatever translation you want. If you can, start off with by going to Genesis 2. We're going to read verses 15 to 17. But before you do, this is going to be a multi-part series. There may be six, seven, eight, nine parts in the series. Because I'm going to go slow and I'm going to methodically refute his arguments, demonstrate he's neither qualified to criticize the Bible or defend Islam <clears throat> by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if we go to Genesis 2, verses 15 to 17, let's look at what God told Adam would happen in the day that he ate of the tree, in the day that he ate his tree, to see whether the serpent was right or what, whether the serpent was wrong and Shabir is really desperate to try to assault the true word of God to his shame and humiliation. If you don't mind, brother, read Genesis 2, 15 to 17. Very good. I'll start with verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. So notice the warning. God expressly, explicitly says, and folks, if you want meat, you're going to get meat if you pay attention. Ask the Spirit to help you pay attention. Don't be distracted because you're going to see how deep the Word of God is because the Bible's Word of God, not the Quran. how beautiful and it truly is inspired by the true God. God says to Adam, the day you eat, you shall die. Now let's go to Genesis 3 and let's read verses 1 <clears throat> all the way to verse 7. Now I want you to pay attention specifically to verse 5. Genesis 3 verses 1 to 7. And in verse 5, what does the serpent tell Eve? <clears throat> in verse 5? No, read Genesis 3, verses 1 to 7. You drop the ball, I'm going to punish David Wood. Genesis 3, verses 1 to 7, but specifically verse 5. Got it. Uh, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God has had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has, uh, has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. Verse 5, For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, if you can pause right there real, real quickly, brother. Notice in 4, he says, you won't die. But in 5 says, on the contrary, pay attention. God himself knows that in the day you eat of the, the tree of the knowledge and good and evil, then you will be like God, Elohim, and that you will then be able to distinguish good and evil for yourself. So notice the two claims of the devil. First, he says, you won't die, contrary to what God said. He said, you won't die. And then he says, your minds will be open to know good and evil like God. So you'll be like God in that sense. Now, after she eats in 6 and 7, what happens to them in 6 and 7? Now, you're right, right. Five. now read 6 and 7. Very good. Verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Now, here's what's interesting. I, had, I just recently discovered that one rabbinic opinion this was kind of interesting to me. One rabbinic opinion says that the fruit was fig. It was the fig tree. Why? Because they made clothes from the, uh, from the fig tree. Did you catch it? They made leaves. They took leaves and made garments. And this leaves was from what? What kind of fruit was it? A fig, right? What did fig it say? Tree. Yeah, so ironically, 
there are some rabbis, certain rabbinic interpretations that say that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was figs. Interesting. Uh, quite mm. interesting. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible does not say that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they ate from was the fig tree. But that's the inference made by some rabbis that since they sewed <clears throat> aprons or garments from, from the leaves taken from the fig tree, assumption, well, if the leaves was from the fig tree, then that means the tree of the knowledge and good and evil must have been the fig tree, which they were forbidden to eat from. Anyway, put that aside. Notice the claims of the devil again. No claims of the devil again. He said, you won't die. And then verse 5, on the contrary, your minds will be open and you'll be like God in the sense that you'll know good and evil, distinguish good and evil like God. You know, it's interesting, folks. Adam and Eve did not die in that day. And God himself said, now the man has become like us, knowing to distinguish between good and evil. Read Genesis 3, verse 22, brother, if you can. Very Genesis good. 3, 22. 22 says, then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Well, now, did you catch it, guys? Did you catch that God confirmed at least that part of Satan <clears throat> that was correct? They have now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now we need to stop them from reaching out and eating of the tree of life to live forever to remedy their situation, their condition. So the implication, and it's not just Shabir Ali who brings it up. You have skeptics or those who oppose the Bible who will use this to try to show the Bible's inconsistent or that Satan was right, the serpent was right, and that God wasn't being absolutely forthright. God forbid such blasphemy. So how do we respond to that? Now, see, there's a response, spiritual death. Well, number one, some will say, well, they died spiritually. Others will say, well, technically, Adam did die in that day because a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. You'll find that stated in Psalm 90, verse 4, which we don't need to turn to, and 2 Peter 3, verse 8. In Psalm 90, verse 4, and 2 Peter 3, verse 8, there we're told that to God a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like yesterday. It's mean, you know, to God, he's above time. He transcends time. Therefore, since Genesis 5, verse 5, and guys, pay attention here. Genesis 5, verse 5 says that Adam was 930 years old when he died. Technically, he did not live a full day in God's sight. And he did die in that day. Because if a day to God is a thousand years, Adam died when he was 930, then he died in that day because he didn't live to be a thousand years, which constitutes a day in God's sight. Now, Shiva Ali and others say that's a stretch. You're stretching it. Well, what about the view that he died spiritually? They'll say, well, where does the text say that God was speaking of spiritual death? Where does the text say God was speaking of spiritual death? That the day you eat of it, you shall spiritually die, not physically. Especially when in Genesis 3.19, God says to him, from the dust you came and from the dust you shall return, right? In Genesis 3.19. So they'll tell you, they're going to tell you, hold on. Where did you get spiritual death? You're reading later theology. The theology of Paul back into Genesis. And that's what Shabir Ali is going to do. He's going to do say, say that to you. So what happened? Adam didn't die like God said. And Genesis 2 verse 17 clearly says that Adam would die in that day that he ate of it. But he didn't. So was Satan right? And God was playing fast and loose? God forbid such blasphemy? No. The story of Genesis is a story of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this is why I said we're going to have to do multi-part series on this. Multi-part series on this <clears throat> Amen. to unpack it. Now, I'm going to give you the gospel in Genesis 3. The gospel of Jesus Christ is all in Genesis 3. Okay? Now, Hallelujah. let me break it down for you. The reason why God wasn't lying when he said in the day that Adam eats, he would die, and yet Adam didn't die in that day, and that still doesn't mean God was lying, is because now you're going to be introduced to substitutionary atonement, vicarious death. Why? Because now let's go back to Genesis 3 and read verse 21. 
Boy, that's that's a boatload of theology, my friend. I want to unpack it. Yeah, three twenty-one. All right. Yeah. So, verse twenty-one in Genesis three: The Lord God made garments of skin of for Adam and his wife and clothed them. I'm going to read it again. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Okay, did you catch it? When they made clothes out of leaves from a fig tree, they made their own garments. God could still see through their clothing, see their nakedness, their shame, and their sin. It wasn't until God made coats of skin and covered them that their nakedness and shame had now been covered. In other words, they tried by their own effort to cover their shame and guilt, but God could still see through it. God has to clothe you in order for your shame and guilt to be covered before his sight. Did you learn that theological truth? Let me repeat it again. I'm going to give you the gospel in Genesis 3. This is what Shabir is missing because he follows a false prophet, an antichrist, a son of Satan, and he's under the influence of the devil that he can't see the meat of scripture and how it's all pointing to Jesus. I repeat again. What you learn here is when you try to cover your own shame and guilt, you will fail because God will still see your shame and guilt. He'll see through your covering and see your shame and guilt. It's not until and unless God covers over your shame and guilt that you'll be covered and clothed and your shame hidden from God. God has to clothe you to cover your shame. You can't do it on your own because if you try to cover your shame, you'll still be naked before God. But if God clothes you and covers up your shame, then your shame and guilt will be covered up in the sight of God. Everyone realize that before I move on? Are you getting that point? Everybody give us indication, please. I want to make sure you give me feedback. Now, notice that the garments that God made were garments, coats of skin. They were not made from leaves. They were not made from the plants. They were not made from the trees. They were made from skin. But folks, the only human beings at that time was Adam and Eve. Where did God get the coats of skin? Where did God get the coats of skin? He had to have gotten them from an animal, not right. humans. Adam and Eve are the only humans. That means the first sacrifice made to cover over sin was made by God in the garden. An animal had to be sacrificed from whose skins God made clothing to cover over the shame of Adam and Eve. So God makes atonement for Adam and Eve the first atoning sacrifice in the garden, and that sacrifice was made by God Himself and not someone else. Yeah, that's, that's the second. Point. But go ahead, brother. Okay. And I just want to mention something. I mean, you made a, an amazing uh, observation. I hope everybody's catching. You know, in a couple of chapters or in the next chapter, one of the sons is gonna yeah. kill his brother. Why? Because one offered a blood sacrifice was accepted. One offered a plant-based sacrifice and wasn't accepted. It's almost the same. Yeah, exactly. So now let's lead to the third point. If you're following me, you're going to be blown away that you're going to have no doubt this book is truly God's word. It is supernatural. And the depth of it shows this comes from the wisdom and mind of God. And the God of the Bible is real. There's no doubt about it. But if an animal had to be sacrificed, that means a death occurred. Therefore, the reason why Adam and Eve did not die that day, because God allowed someone else to take their place and die in their place so they could be spared and allowed to continue to linger on the earth for more than that day. Did you catch it now? I repeat it again. A death did occur. Adam did die in a sense. Because an animal died in the place of Adam, representing Adam, taking Adam's death on, him, on himself so that Adam could be spared and allowed to live so he could then reproduce the human race. So God still remained faithful to his word. You eat of the tree, you must die. But in my mercy, I want you to live so you can reproduce, replenish the earth because they didn't have children at that time. Otherwise, mankind would be wiped out. So I'm going to allow an animal to die in your place. So I'm going to allow substitutionary atonement. You must die, but I'll allow someone to die in your place so you can be spared. There's the gospel in Genesis 3 from the beginning, 
pointing to Jesus Christ. Amen. And it's called Proto Evangelion, which is the type of gospel. Good news. Yes. So you get it now, right? It's making sense now. It's sinking in. So God did not prove false. God did not lie. Adam had to die. But God in his love and mercy showed there is a way in which you can escape the death you deserve by having someone else die in your place and take your punishment so that your life can be spared. And, uh, you know, it's amazing because death did happen that day. Yeah, it happened. Yeah. You know, so God didn't lie. And it was substitution. And here, here's what's so interesting, Sam. And I know you know about this. I'm just mentioning it to, for the benefit of those. You know the story of Abraham in the Quran when and وَفَدَيْنَاهُ بِذَبْحٍ عظيم, And we substituted for him with a greater sacrifice. You know what this, many of the commentators of the Quran say? This lamb was in heaven, actually. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> Interesting. God willing, we should do a show on that and how that also points to Christ and how the Quran uh, butchers it. Now, coming back to the issue so you guys don't lose focus <clears throat> And see how amazing this book is that you take for granted, that I take for granted. The Bible is amazing. We need to eat it up. It is spiritual nourishment. Now, so an animal died in the place of Adam so that Adam could be spared. And yet God remained faithful to his word and not lie and break his word that if you eat, you must die. So I will allow the animal to take your death upon him. Now, do you understand why God spared Adam? Let me show you the wisdom of God here. What if God had said, okay, you're going to die now? You know what the problem is? There would be no human race. Because don't forget that at this moment when Adam and Eve sinned, they had no children. So if Adam and Eve were put to death that day, that would be the end of humanity. Which means that either God would have to recreate a new human couple or abandon the whole human project altogether. So you see, again, their nature of sin was such that when they sinned, they had no children. So if they had died, they would not procreate. They would not procreate. So we got another demon, uh, a dog of the devil saying wrong teaching, but he's not man enough to call and debate. So he can keep barking. But I just had to let you know. They did not procreate. When did Adam and Eve have children? After they were expelled from the garden. In Genesis 4, it says, Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And then later on, she conceived and gave birth to Abel. So now understand, if God did carry out his justice that moment, the end of the human race, humanity, unless God then recreates another human couple. So what did God do? He didn't give them justice and then decide to abandon the human project, no humans whatsoever, or recreate another human couple. He decided something else. You deserve to die. But my command for you was to be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth. If I now give you what you deserve, you die without fulfilling my commission because you have no children. So guess what? I'm going to allow an animal to die in your place to take your punishment and then use the skin of the animal to cover over your shame so that I can extend mercy to you so that you can fulfill my command to reproduce and replenish the earth. You see the wisdom of God? Amen. Now let's stop right here. Uh, the Black Prophet, I challenge you now to come here on my show and debate Sam. Otherwise, shut your mouth before I toss you out of here. Yep. That's so they're brave right. behind the computer screen. But for everyone else, I want you to see the gospel in Genesis 3. Now, let me further unpack the gospel in Genesis 3. Let me further unpack the gospel of Genesis 3. Now, remember before Adam and Eve sinned, they were in a state of innocence. Their minds were innocent, their minds were pure, not tainted, so they could be in each other's presence naked and not ashamed. Why? Because their minds was in a state of innocence and they saw things <clears throat> in a state of purity. What they saw, they saw in that mind that had been corrupted by sin. So they were viewing things in that light, in a state of innocence, from the perspective of purity, all things were good. All things were pure. Everything to them was good and pure. But now what happened after they ate? Now let's see what happens after they eat. So in Genesis 3, 6, they ate. Let's pick it up at 3. Let's read 6 to 8. All right, verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Uh, go all the way to eight, right? 
Yeah, now notice eight, what happens? Yeah, then, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in a garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now pay attention to now the effects of sin. Notice before they ate, they were naked and a state of purity and innocence and they were not ashamed. Why? Because they saw their nakedness and saw everything in that state of innocence and purity. The moment they ate, notice what sin does, folks. You guys got to pay attention. Number one, sin corrupts your mind. It has a negative, what we call noetic effect. Sin corrupts your mind, corrupts your thoughts, corrupts your perception, corrupts, corrupts your desires. So that which was innocent now becomes shameful, embarrassing, and evil and impure. So you catch what happened? Sin, sin corrupts the mind, taints your worldview. So that which was innocent now becomes something shameful and pitiful. Confirming what Titus 1.15 says. It says, Titus 1.15, if you are pure and your mind is pure, then you'll see all things pure. But to the corrupt, everything becomes impure in their sight. So notice the effects of sin. Sin did to Adam and Eve what it does to people like Nadir Ahmed, who's here stalking Christians like a stalker in our comment section, who, although he's a Sunni Muslim, went and did muta with a woman for a month, did muta, divorced her and dumped her, who also threatened to physically maim a Muslim named Osama Abdullah, and yet this demon, this dog of Satan, comes here stalking us because he wants attention so he can make him famous. So this is what sin does. Nadir Ahmed is an example of a son of Satan, a bastard of the devil who's been corrupted by sin. May God deal with him. So just keep in mind what sin did to the mind of Adam and Eve, right? They were naked, but before they ate of that tree, their nakedness was something that they saw as good and it was innocent and pure. The moment they ate, their minds became corrupted, their thoughts became corrupted, their perception became corrupted, and now that which was innocent became impure and shameful. So notice that sin corrupts your perception, corrupts the way you perceive reality. That's the first effect of sin. Notice the second effect of sin. Guys, are you ready? The second effect of sin. When God came to meet with them in the garden, did they run to God or did they run away from God and hide from God? What did they do? Did they run to God? Run or the God. moment they heard God, they ran from him and hid from him. That's right. So you guys caught it, right? So the second effect of sin is that sin causes you to be too ashamed to face God and causes you to run from the presence of God which is why God has to come looking for you. Did you catch it? Sin not only corrupts your mind, it also taints your ability to run to God for help, run to God for salvation, because when God shows up because of sin, instead of running to him, you flee from his presence out of shame and guilt. So God then comes looking for you, chasing after you. That's the second effect of sin. Now let's continue. That was Genesis 3, verse 8. Now let's read verse 9. Oh, man, that was loud. To 13. All right. Genesis 3, 9 mm -hmm. to 13. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave, uh, gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Verse 13. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. Now, notice the further effect of sin, folks. I hope you're paying attention. I hope you're listening. And don't let Nadir, the filthy dog of Muhammad, disturb you, the Muta lover, the son of Muta. 
block him and send him to Mecca to kiss the black stone if he's disturbing you. But focus for the glory of Jesus. Every one of you guys focus. Did you see the other effect of sin? For those of you paying attention, did you see the other effect of sin? What's the other effect of sin? Notice when God confronts them about their sin. Instead of confessing their sin, they try to justify their sin, excuse their sin, and find someone else to blame for their sinfulness. Sin hinders you from taking responsibility for your action and repenting. You see what Adam said? Why are you hiding from me? Did you eat of the tree? The woman you gave me made me eat. Notice he did two things. He blamed the woman and blamed the God for giving him the woman. The woman you gave me. Now notice what he did, which we do to this day. And I want everyone to listen. God in his goodness, his compassion, mercy, and love gives us graces. And yet we take those same graces and when we misuse them, we then throw it in the face of God and blame him for that grace that he gave for our well-being and blame him for misusing that grace. Notice. Why did God give him the woman? Because in Genesis 2.18, God said it's not good for man to be alone. So I'm going to make a helper suitable for him. So what God gave to Adam out of his kindness and love for Adam, Adam took and threw it back in God's face. The woman you gave me made me eat. You see what sin does? Sin causes you to be unappreciative of the graces of God. And many of you here can bear witness of that. God has given you health. God has given you sound minds. God has given you good jobs. And you still complain. You still whine. You still get angry at God or don't show him enough gratitude for the blessings in your life. And complain about the things you don't have instead of the things you already have by his grace. You see what sin does? And you see the effects of sin being exemplified in Adam and Eve. The woman you gave me made me eat. And then when he goes to Eve, what does Eve do? Blames the serpent, even though the serpent didn't put a gun to her head. The serpent didn't force you, Eve, to eat. He he instigated, tried to cause you stu to stumble, tempted you. But you could have resisted him. So again, pay attention to the effects of sin. Sin hinders our ability to confess to God, turn to God, and repent. What sin makes us do is justify our sin and find someone else, blame that someone else, and hold that someone else responsible for our moral failures, our sinfulness. You see how much meat in Genesis 3. All of this in Genesis 3. And where do you find the gospel? Notice when God showed up. Notice when God showed up. He showed Amen. up at the moment of their, of their sin when they fell into darkness when they fell into sin and corrupted themselves, God showed up to the rescue. God showed up to the rescue because it's not a coincidence. He shows up at that moment when they sin and he goes and searches for them and finds them in order to restore them and clothe them and cover their shame and sinfulness. Everyone getting it? Brother, you got it? Yeah, and, and you know, this is powerful, Sam, because it shows that God is a relational yes. God. Yet, contrast now what sin did, Adam was even cutting off his ties with his own wife. I mean, it's just amazing. So this day, right? History repeats itself, right? Now, here's where I'm going to show you Jesus in all of this. I'm going to show you guys Jesus in all of this, okay? Now, sadly, some translations do not capture Genesis 3.8 as accurate as possible. If you go back to the previous sessions, we did a session in Genesis 3.8. Do you remember when Shabir complained about the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. Go back, re-listen to that session that I did. It was session one. Here. It was session one. Right? Session one. I explained what the Hebrew means. It's Ruach Hayom, the spirit of the day. I showed you from Genesis 3.8, the Trinity. I'm not going to go over the same points I already discussed in part one. Go back, listen. You got to listen until it becomes second nature so you can understand this and absorb this and share it and use it for the glory of God. Ruach Hayom. So there, the Lord God showed up with the spirit of the day, the spirit who illuminates, enlightens you to bring you out of the darkness into the day, into the light. Already unpacked that. But let's go back and look at Genesis 3.8, but we're going to look at it in the King James Version because I want to show you who comes for the rescue mission. 
In Genesis 3, verse 8, who comes for in the rescue mission, right? Yeah, I'm going to go to the King James right now. Yep. When you get there, let me know. All right. I am there. And Genesis 3, verse 8 in King James translation. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And now, guys, literally, did you hear what the translation says? Let me repeat the literal translation. And they heard the voice of the Lord God. Now, I'm going to read an American Standard Version. And they heard the voice, not the sound, the call, the voice of Jehovah God walking. In other words, it was the voice that was walking. God's voice was walking to them. And they heard the voice walking. Did you guys catch it? It's not simply hearing the sound of God walking. That's not what the Hebrew is saying. What the Hebrew is saying is they heard the voice walking. Whose voice? God's voice. God's voice shows up and God's voice walks and they hear the voice walking. In other words, the voice of God is a person, a divine person <clears throat> who is one with God, whom God sends to appear and speak to his servants. So the voice shows up. It's not bad call. Bad call means the daughter of the voice. No. It's not the daughter voice. It's Kol Yahovah Elohim. The voice of the Lord God walking. So God's voice is his word, who's a divine person sent by God to meet with the people of God. So the voice came to them. The voice was walking to them. The voice came looking for them. Now, in case you think I'm making this up, let me again give you my two-part article on Genesis 3. Here it is. I'm going to put it in the comment section on YouTube. On YouTube. And then give it to me and I'll put it in the description. Yes. Here you go. Here's part one. I'm going to post the link twice. Here it is. That's part one. Because I'm going to show you how the Jews interpret it. Was that part one? Hold on. I think that was part one, right? Hold on. Oh, sorry. Wrong. Yeah, yeah, that was part one. Yep, yep, it was. Here's part two. I'm going to show you how the Jews interpret this. Now, here's part two, guys. Here's part two. No, not the voice of the Holy Spirit, Alisa. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Now, yeah, Alisa, you made him come to Islam. We, we need him. Yeah, yeah, no. Alisa, it's not the voice of the Holy Spirit. I just told you. The voice is a person sent by God, who is the Word of God, that comes looking for us. How can that be the Holy Spirit when the voice is the Word and the Word is Jesus Christ, who works in union with the Holy Spirit? Hey, al Masihu Akbar. All right. Now, I just gave you the links. It's a two part article. And I posted the links to both parts twice. Now, let me read to you the Targum, meaning the Aramaic paraphrase, the Aramaic translation, the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament done by Jews. This is a translation done by Jews, Jews who are not Christians, Jews who are not Trinitarians, who don't read the New Testament, who don't follow the Bible. When they translated Old Testament Aramaic, here's how they translated it. Now, this comes, this is all in my article, by the way. This comes from the Targum, Targumim, Targum of Ankeros. In, in Arabic, Targum. Yeah, Targum. We say in my language, Targum. We say Targum. Yeah. Targumim. The Targums, the interpretation of Ankelos. And Jonathan ben Uziel on the Pentateuch with fragments of the Jerusalem Targum from the Chaldee. Translated by J.W. Etheridge. This is all in my article. How did they translate Genesis 3? Get ready, folks. Here's how they translated it. And they heard the voice of the word of the Lord God walking in the garden. Let me repeat again. And they heard the voice of the word of of the Lord God walking in the garden. Even the Jews saw that the voice of the Lord was actually the word of God walking and appearing visibly to Adam and Eve. Now here's the Jerusalem Targum. Jerusalem Targum. 
walking in the garden, the strength of the day, and the word of the Lord called to Adam. Who called to Adam? The word of the Lord called to Adam. But Genesis 3.8 says Jehovah called to Adam. So did you notice, here the Jews who translated the Old Testament Aramaic identified the voice of the Lord who was walking as the word of God. Again, this is from Ankelos, Ganathan bin Uziel, all of my article and the Jerusalem Targum. And he said, Adam said, the voice of thy word I heard in the garden. Whose voice did you hear, Adam? The voice of his word. I heard the voice of your word in the garden. Now, again, wow, the that's amazing. Targum, yeah. right? Jerusalem Targum. And the word of the Lord said, and the word of the Lord said, Behold, Adam, whom I have created, is soul in my world, as I am soul in heavens above. Wow. Now, here's another one, another citation from the Targum, right? And they heard the voice of the word of the Lord God walking in the garden in the evening of the day. And then later it says, Adam says, the voice of thy word heard I in the garden. My goodness. Did you guys catch that? Everyone catch it? So even the Jews who are not Christians, who are not Trinitarians, who don't follow the New Testament, when they translate Old Testament into Aramaic, they understood the one who walked in the garden, the one who came to their rescue, the one who ran to their aid was the word of the Lord called the voice of the Lord in Hebrew. And who is that word? Who's that voice? John 1, 14 tells us that's the word, that's the voice who became flesh, and we know him as Jesus of Nazareth. Folks, you understand what that means? It was Jesus in the garden with the Holy Spirit, Ruach Hayom, the spirit of the day who brings you into the day out of the darkness. Jesus showed up with the spirit with him. Jesus came looking for Adam and Eve in the moment they plunged in sin and darkness, and Jesus came to then deliver them atone for them, spare their life, and promise them the hope of salvation. Amen. I want to just let it Amen. speak in for a minute. Right? Everyone got it? So if you, you got it, there is the gospel in Genesis 3. So what did you learn? Sin corrupts your mind, your perception, your thoughts, your desires. Sin makes you incapable of running to God and confessing, it causes you to run away from God's presence and hide your sin and justify it and find someone else to blame <clears throat> blame for your sin. These are all the effects of sin. So God as mercy comes to rescue you from sin and enable you to turn to him and receive his love and forgiveness and his provision to cover over your, over your sin and shame. You see, now I'm gonna. Go, I have other points, but I'm giving them a minute to sink in. Right? Okay. Eli asked me to repeat it again. Okay, I'll repeat it one more time. Okay. You see in Genesis three the effects of sin. Sin affects your thoughts, your perception, your desires. Right? And sin makes it such a way that a man who falls in sin is incapable of running to God and confessing. On the contrary, sin causes you to run from God's presence like Adam and Eve did, to then justify your sin like Adam and Eve did, or find someone to blame for your sin, a scapegoat. And so what does God do? In his mercy, he runs to you knowing that you can't run to him. What did Jesus say in Luke 19, 10? For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. See, you're lost. And you, you don't even know you're lost. So the last thing you're going to do is look for God. God, knowing your condition, knowing what sin has done to you, knowing because of sin you won't seek him, he comes, seeks after you, and calls you, and then enables you by calling you to come to him and confess so he can clothe you in his love and mercy and compassion. Amen. Who would have thought Amen. there was this much meat in the Bible? So just to recap, God did not lie when he said in that day Adam would die. Satan lied when he said he wouldn't die because Adam did have to die, but Satan wasn't counting on God's mercy. Let me explain to you.
the strategy of Satan. I keep calling him Satan, even though it says the serpent, because we know from later revelation that serpent is Satan. Maybe we'll do a talk on whether the serpent was an animal or a spirit creature in rebellion to God. What the serpent was banking on is that when Adam and Eve sinned, then God, being a just God, would have to condemn them to death and end the human race. Guys, let me give you a little peek into the mind of Satan from God's word. Not because I want to think like Satan, God forbid, but because we have the wisdom of God, the Holy Bible, and the Holy Bible tells us how Satan thinks so we can protect ourselves from him. Protect ourselves from him. This is how the serpent was thinking. Since God said that Adam and Eve would die in the day they ate of it, and the serpent knowing that God cannot lie, cannot break his word, therefore if I can make them eat, then that means God is going to be forced to kill them dead and the end of the human race, and I'll be done with humanity. So that's what he was banking on. But because serp the serpent is not all-knowing and underestimates the love and compassion of God, he didn't realize that God would allow a substitute to take the place of Adam and Eve in death so that a death did occur to fulfill God's justice and keep God's command. But it wasn't the death of Adam and Eve, but the death of a substitute whom God would allow to die in the place of Adam and Eve so he can spare Adam and Eve and allow them to reproduce the human race. So God outsmarted the serpent. Didn't deceive him. That's Allah and his messenger. You see how amazing your Bible is? Amen. Amen, brother. Do you see how amazing your Bible is? And by the they way, Sam, uh, they're, saying, they're saying the links did not post. So everybody, don't panic, please. Take a deep right. breath. He's going to give them to me. I yes, will I post them for you. So you guys will have them. Actually, it did post. So I saw it posting unless someone blocked me because I'm Shemunian. Here it goes. Okay, guys, tell me if you see this. There it goes. That's one. All right. If you don't see it, then that means I'm blocked. I don't know. Why would that be blocked? I'm going to go after them. I mean, I, I did tell them not to block you, even though you, you talk okay, to me all the time, but it's okay. Okay. Now, here's the second part two. There it goes. So you got it there, guys. Don't panic. Okay. So everyone saw the meat of Genesis 3, how it implodes in the face of Shabir Ali and shows that Shabir's God is the, the devil and Muhammad is an antichrist, which is why, Shabir, you're a coward. You won't debate me because I will send you packing and retire you from apologetics by the power of Jehovah Jesus, Muhammad's God and judge. Take me up on my four debate challenges. I've challenged you four debates. Man up. Don't make excuses. Let's do them. Let's see if he's going to do it. So if that was clear, everyone got it. Is that clear? If everyone got it, we're going to move to another objection because in his silliness, in his silliness, okay, he, he let me, let me read what he said. This was, I mean, anyway, what are you going to do? Here goes. Look what he says here. After he said that, he says, <clears throat> he implies in his talk, he says like, it's almost like God was afraid of Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of eternity, the tree of of life. It's like God was afraid. Stop them. Cherubim, don't let them do that. Now, again, let's expose Shabir to show that he truly is someone used of the devil to pervert scripture, but only to his shame because the Lord will raise up his soldiers to expose these Bible perverts. Let's go back to Genesis 3. Let's read 22 to 24. Okay. Genesis 3, 22 to 24. Let's, okay, let's read one more time. Yeah, you don't, uh, need, you don't need to need the King James now. Read another. All right. Let me, let me just change uh, the uh, translation. Well, if you want to say anything else, uh, yeah. feel free. Let me explain to you. This again shows God's wisdom. This again shows God's mercy in barring them from the tree of life. Why is God barring them from the tree of life? Yeah, okay. 22, 24, right? Yeah. Genesis 3, 22, all the way to 24. All right. I'm ready. Uh, verse 22. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us knowing good and evil, and now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and, uh, uh, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed 
the cherubim and flaming sword which turns every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Mm -hmm. So is God barring Adam and Eve from the tree of life because he's afraid for them to live forever? Now to show you how silly of an objection that is and to show you how blasphemous it is, God could have simply struck them dead at the spot, right? I mean, they won't even be able to make it to the tree because God could take away their breath and cause them to die instantly and return to the dust. So then why is God barring, barring them? This is, again, God's mercy because if Adam and Eve were to eat of the tree of life in bodies that now had been tainted, defiled by sin, that means they would live forever in sinful bodies, sinning against God, rebelling against God without any end to their sin. And then their children likewise, so that the entire world would be a world full of ever-living sinners, just increasing pain, misery, chaos, and destruction. And that was not God's purpose for mankind. So the reason why he barred them is because God will not allow people in sinful bodies with sinful tendencies who rebel against them, who spread corruption, to live forever in that state, in that con condition. This is why God intends at the end to transform all those who have believed in Christ so that we who are alive, when Jesus comes, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 58. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 58, it says, In a twinkling of an eye, this perishable will put on imperishable. This mortal will become immortal, where God will now change me, where I will be morally incorruptible. I will never sin again. I will never rebel again, never bring God's judgment again, and I will be <clears throat> morally incorruptible, living in a physical body that's now indestructible. Because God wants us to live forever in moral perfection, living forever in perfect fellowship and union with God and one another, but that cannot exist if there's sin Sin has to be removed and eradicate, eradicated from the human condition so that we don't repeat this again. Can you imagine in the new heavens and the earth, if God doesn't change our DNA, our human structure in such a way where we cannot sin ever again, can you imagine then the potentiality of sinning again and starting this misery all over again? So this is wisdom on God's part. They will not continue to live forever in these kinds of bodies. Bodies prone to sin, sinful bodies that will cause them to sin and rebel and experience pain and disease, but never die and then spread mischief and misery forever and ever on this earth. That's not happening. The day will come where I will change the human condition, the human DNA, eradicate sinful nature, make them morally incorruptible, physically indestructible, so that there will be no more sin, no more death, no more pain, no more misery, but that is in the future. Not right now. So everyone got that? You got that too, brother? Or Amen. Am I torturing you? No, it's it's a lot of fun, my brother. The final objection I'll answer for this session, the final one, because we're coming close to an hour. He even insinuates that, see, God asks questions. And the way he, he says it, it's like almost like, did God ask because he did not know? Why did God ask Adam and Eve? Hey, Adam, where are you? Did you eat of the tree? Eve, what happened? So he's insinuating, implying that God asked because he did not know. Okay, now let's refute that canard. In scripture, God will often ask someone to confound him or her, to show him and her they don't know what they're talking about. Now let me explain to you <clears throat> the biblical reasons given for God asking questions. Are you ready? Because I'm teaching you theology by the grace of God's spirit. Trusting the Spirit to save me from error. Number one, God can often ask questions not because he expects answers, but to stump the person, to shame the person, to humble the person, to show the person he or she doesn't know what they're talking about. You find Jesus doing this often, and I'll give you one example from Jesus. Mark 12, 35 to 37. Mark 12, 35 to 37. All right. I'm going to go there, Mark 12. 35 to 37. 
All right, 35 reads. And Jesus began to say, as he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that, that the Christ is the son of David? David himself said in the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. Verse 37, David himself calls him Lord. So in what sense is he his son? And the large crowd enjoyed listening to him. So was Jesus asking because he didn't know the answer? Or is he asking to stump those so-called religious scholars who thought they were spiritual and knowledgeable? He was asking to stump them. He was asking to show you're not as knowledgeable as you think you are. You're not as spiritual as you think you are. Because I'm going to ask you a question to show you you don't know what you're talking about. And he silenced them. So one of the reasons why God asks questions is not because he doesn't know and wants you to educate him. On the contrary, he asks a question to humble you and expose you to show you you're not as great as you think and you don't know as much as you think you know. That's number one. The second reason why God asks is to procure a confession, to get you to confess. Let me prove that to you from Scripture. In Genesis 4, after Cain was angry and irate that God didn't accept his sacrifice, God then tells him, why are you upset? Let's go to Genesis 4. Let's write, I was going to start seven. Let's read 6 to 10. Watch here. Genesis 4, 6 to 10. Genesis 4. All right. You're going to go there. 6 to 10. All right. In Genesis 4, starting from verse 6, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your content, uh, countenance uh, fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Mm -hmm. Verse 8, Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, uh, his brother, and killed him. Uh, verse 9, then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he says, I do not know. Now, before you move on, see, God is asking. Now, notice God's timing, how perfect it is. Once Cain kills Abel, God shows up. Hey, Cain, where is your brother Abel? So God is asking, where is your brother Abel, Cain? Notice what Cain said. How do I know? Finish it. Right. Uh, then the Lord said to Cain, where is your, uh, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? He said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now pause there, folks. Did you catch it? God didn't ask Cain because he didn't know where Abel was. God asked Cain to confront Cain with his evil, wicked, murderous heart. Because right after Cain says, how do I know? Am I my brother's keeper? What have you done? The blood of your brother cries out to him. In other words, I already know what you did. You murdered your brother in cold blood out of hate. And you thought you could cover it up. And it's plural bloods. So why did God ask Cain to show us and show Cain, look how corrupt and evil you are, that even when I confront you about your brother, you're going to lie about your brother and you're going to cover up about what you did to your brother because you think I don't see all things. Now, let me unpack Genesis 4.10. You understand the implication of Cain's response? That tells you that like us, even Adam and Eve, even Cain and the prophets had to grow in their understanding of who God is and what he's like. Because if Cain truly understood that his creator God is all-knowing and present everywhere, then he would know, wait, God sees everything, knows everything. He knows what I did. But the fact that he could respond that way, how should I know where he is? Am I my brother's keeper? Tells you that Cain didn't know God enough to know that God sees all things, observes all things, and is aware of everything. So he thought he could do something and God wouldn't see it and then lie to God and get away with it so in asking him the question, he showed you how corrupt, unrepentant, and evil Cain was because sin had now taken control over him. So here's proof. God didn't ask because he didn't know. God asked 
to expose Cain. Look how wicked you are, Cain. You think you can hide things from me. You think you can lie and get away with it. That's how evil you are. Therefore, you deserve the judgment I'm about to bring upon you. So why did I ask Adam and Eve? In order to procure a confession and repentance, but then show you that even though he confronts them, they still do not confess and repent. Therefore, my judgment on Adam and Eve is fully deserved. Even when I give them a chance to con confess and repent, they still try to hide their sin and justify it, leaving me no choice but to banish them from my presence. You see why God is asking? Now I'm going to give you another example. Someone who, unlike Cain, Cain didn't know that God knows all things and sees all things. Someone who, unlike Cain, did know that his God knows all things and sees all things. And so when God asks him questions, he realizes God can't be asking me because he doesn't know. Let me show you. John 21, verses 15 to 17. And we're going to wrap it up. John 21. John 21, verses 15 to 17. All right. So John 21, verse 15. This is the encounter between Peter and the Lord. So, uh, verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that uh, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Now notice the difference. Peter knows Jesus is God in the flesh, his sovereign Lord who knows everything. So he says, you already know all things. You know whether I love you or not. So Peter is aware Jesus could not be asking because he didn't know. Do you see the difference between Peter and Cain? Cain, when God confronted him, Cain thought God doesn't see everything, doesn't know everything, so he can lie to God and get away with it. And then he was exposed and ashamed, and he learned a quick theological lesson. He learned the theological lesson the hard way. I see all things. I'm aware of all things. How dare you think you can cover your murder and get away with it? Cain learned, oh, wow. The God who created me is a God who sees all things and is aware of everything that takes place. I'm not going to make that mistake again. Too late. Peter, on the other hand, knew Jesus is God in the flesh. And being the God man, Jesus is God, knows everything. So Peter is hurt. And Peter is saying, Lord, you know all things. I know you're not asking me because you don't know. You would, you're, you'd already know if I love you. And you know my heart. I love you, Lord. So why did Peter? Why did Jesus ask? Guys, you want to see the beauty and compassion and love of our God? How real our God is? How beautiful, compassionate, merciful we are? That when we're fallen and broken, his purpose is not to embarrass you and humiliate you like we do. Like if Al-Fadi falls, ah, look at you. God is a God of infinite love and compassion. That when you're broken and fallen, his desire is to restore you and heal you and lift you up, not shame you and embarrass you. The reason why Jesus asked Simon, if he loved him three times, to make Simon confess his love for every time he denied Jesus. Peter denied Jesus three times. So Jesus in his love made him confess his love as a way of restoring him. I don't know him. Do you love me? I don't know him. Do you love me? I don't know him. Do you love me? That was Jesus' way of lovingly restoring Simon and not humiliating him and shaming him for disowning his Lord. What an infinitely beautiful, loving, compassionate Savior we have in Jesus. He is truly the Lord God Almighty, the eternal Son of the Father, the eternal companion of the Holy Spirit, Muhammad's God, judge, and destroyer. And may the Lord Jesus destroy this wicked religion, destroy the Quran, expose Muhammad, and silence these demons like Shabir Ali until they repent or get what they deserve from the Lord of glory, Jesus Christ, who's risen, who's alive. May he keep us in love with him and fill us with the Spirit. And may he bless our loved ones, my daughters and their mother, to be in love with him in Jesus' name.
there you go, folks. Amen. Hallelujah. And brother, uh, just uh, for the sake of uh, our viewers, you're going to give me the links and I will uh, post it in the description as well. So everyone, if for any reason you didn't see the links, it will be in the description, Lord willing. And by the way, before you hang up, Protestant, are you here in the chat? And the uh, Protestant believer, I think he is. He's my one of my mobs. He's a great he, brother. He converted. He became a Baptist, so he's not uh, here anymore. All right. Well, Protestant believer, here's what I'm, I need to do. I need you to take these sessions because you give me permission. Parts one, parts two, and three. Upload them to my YouTube channel because this information needs to be on multiple YouTube channels so we don't Amen. lose them because this is gold by the grace of Jesus. So, and Protestant believer, I don't pay you nothing for nothing. So, get with it, son. Amen. And I, uh, folks, I did ask Sam and he graciously agreed that we will do professional video series on this as well. And it will be on my channel, his channel and whomever else would like to also uh, have it. So definitely we'll be doing this because these are deep teachings. Remember, folks, I'm going to remind you again, you are not going to get these kind of oh. teaching explanations in a lecture in a seminary. Yes, there's a lot of wonderful professors, theology professors, who's going to give you assignments to go and read and things like that. But to get this depth in explanation, I, I am not aware of any. I, I hope I'm wrong, but I'm not aware of any. Go ahead, brother. brother. Can I now, sorry, I know our time's up. It'll take me two minutes. Can I now turn the tables against Shabir, showing Shabir that if I Please. use his argument, you destroy the Quran and the Sunnah? Please do. Okay. All right, guys, remember what Shabir is hinting at. If God asks questions, that means he must be ignorant. Now, guys, let me give you dessert with icing on it. Let's end it this way. I'm now going to turn this argument against Shabir because in the Quran, his own God, who's not God, who's a fake God, asks questions. Chapter 2, verse 260, Shabir. Now, let's see you explain this away. I'm going to use your own argument against you to bury your Quran. Let's see if you're consistent and a man of integrity. Chapter 2, verse 260 of the uh, Shabir. And remember when Ibrahim said, My Lord, Show me how you give life to the dead. He, Allah, said, do you not believe? Wait, Allah, I thought you know everything. Don't you know whether Abraham believes or not? You see how stupid Shabir sounds? Allah's asking Abraham, do you not believe? He, Abraham, said, yes, but to be stronger in faith. He said, take four birds and do the following. Chapter 9, verse 13, Shabir. Tap chapter 9, verse 13, Shabir. Will you not fight a people who have violated their oaths? And intended to expel the messenger while they did attack you first? Wait, does Allah not know whether they'll fight them or not? Allah, why are you asking, will they fight or not? And then Allah goes on to say, do you fear them? Wait, Allah, don't you already know whether they fear them or not? Why are you asking such silly, stupid questions? Allah has more right that you should fear him if you are believers. A final example from the Quran and one from the Hadith. Chapter 5, verse 116 of the Quran. And when Allah said, O oh, Jesus, son of Mary, chapter 5, verse 116, O oh, Jesus, son of Mary, did you say unto mankind, take me and my mother for two gods besides Allah? He will say, glorified be you. It was not mine to utter that which I had no right. If I used to say it, you would know it. Well, wait, how can he know it if he's asking you? Allah, if you already know what Jesus said, why are you asking? What a stupid thing to ask. You see what you can do with Shabir? You can bury his religion using his pathetic arguments. Now, finally, let's go to the Hadith. Sahil Bukhari, volume 9, number 593. Sahil Bukhari, volume 9, number 593, because he's a Sunni Muslim. Narrated Abu Huraira. Allah's apostle said, Allah created the creation. And when he finished from his creation, the rahm, the womb, got up. See, Muhammad was a sick man. He even thought that a womb was an actual living conscious entity. So the womb got up. And Allah said to it, stop, what do you want? Wow, talk about weird. Number one, you have a living womb that's conscious, can touch and speak. And you got Allah, who in his right mind is talking to a womb and asking, hey, what do you want? Allah, well, who are you talking to? A womb? And why are you asking? Don't you know? What do you want? It said, at this place, I seek refuge with you from all those who sever <clears throat> kinship with me. Allah said, would you be pleased, womb, would you be pleased that I will keep good relation with the one who will keep good relation with you and I will sever the relation with the one who will sever the relation with you? It said, yes, oh, my Lord. Allah said, that is for you. Wait, wait, wait. Allah's having conversation with a womb and then Allah's asking the womb, what do you want? And would it please you if I do this? Okay, then I'll do it. Two things. What in the world is Allah doing talking to a womb? 
And number two, if Allah knows everything, why is he asking when he already knows what the womb wants? Shabir, you just buried your religion and your prophet in the pit of hell where they belong. Keep blaspheming against Jesus and we'll keep silencing you and debate me on those four topics so I can retire you by the power of King Jesus. There you go. And, and maybe we should post these uh, Quranic verses because maybe Shabir and his team don't have access to them for yeah. some reason. All right, buddy. So, uh, yeah, as always, we appreciate you. You and I will talk about uh, next week because we still have to finish Christology also. And, uh, and then we'll revisit uh, this particular series as well. Thank you, everyone, for being here with us. Uh, thank you to the moderators. Uh, as I said, folks, relax. I'll have the links that uh, Sam uh, wanted to post for us. If some of you didn't get them, I'll have them in the description box itself. Thanks, brother. We love you, and we appreciate you. Lord bless you all. Take care. Amen.